Good morning and welcome to Faith Church. I'm Brian Jones, your liturgist this morning, March 14th, the fourth Sunday in Lent. I have two announcements to begin with this morning. First, we invite you and your family to join us for Palm Sunday, March 28th. As is tradition with our Palm Sunday services, we will include a Palm Processional. The processional will be virtual again this year. Please take a video with a phone, a camcorder, a laptop, or tablet of you waving a palm leaf or the palm cross we included in your Lent in a parcel or even a natural branch from any tree. Share your video with Gina Dawson by Friday, March 19th. More details about recording a video or this meaningful worship service can be found in What's Working in Faith. Secondly, this entire year, we at Faith Church have committed to ring our bell each Tuesday at 6 p.m. We hope you've had the opportunity to hear our bells. We are asking again for volunteers to ring the bell this spring. While it only takes one person to ring, this is a great opportunity for families of all sizes, shapes, and ages to share in a form of prayer. You may choose a day to participate on our Sign Up Genius, whose link can be found in the March Good News and today's bulletin. Welcome to worship with Faith United Methodist Church. I'm the Reverend Dr. Laura Norvell. It is good to gather in the ways that we're able in this season. On this fourth Sunday in Lent, we continue our exploration of the Sermon on the Mount, which Brian McLaren sets up as instructions for how we are called to live in Jesus' teachings, day in and day out. Today, we talk about a long list of teachings that boil down to whether or not we really understand that we are indeed beloved of God. Once there was a man who said and did such amazing things that people began to follow him. One day, one of those followers asked him, who are you? And the man answered, I am the light of the world. Come, let us worship in the light.
Please join me in the opening prayer. Lord and Creator, let us embrace the costly blessings which you desire for us, blessings that confound the wisdom and strength of this world. Teach us to be your agents of preservation in a world touched by death and beacons of hope in a world shrouded in darkness. Transform us into your image through the crucible of the cross, writing your mandates upon our hearts made pure by your perfect love. Embolden us to be your ambassadors, living as representatives of your holy kingdom, stirring in us your love for others. Make us decrease so that you might increase as a watching world sees you, not us. Daily we declare that your priorities are ours, even before our own needs and desires. Free us of any distraction, craving, or anxiety that would keep us from fully following you. Remind us of our skill, sinful brokenness and your gift of grace as we encounter brokenness in others. You are the answer to our every question. You are the treasure that we desperately seek. And it is you who invite us into your salvation as prodigals returning to the Father's embrace. Keep us upon your path of righteousness and justice, bearing the good fruit of your spirit. For it is on you, Lord Jesus, that all hope is built for all of creation, now and forevermore. Amen. It's time for our children's message, so I invite our kids to gather around. The whole month of March, Church in the Box has you talking about things that Jesus did with his friends before Easter. This week's lesson was about a special meal that Jesus shares with his friends. He gathers with them to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. And as they are feasting together, Jesus takes the bread that they have at their meal and he says to them, this bread is special. From now on, when you eat together, I want you to remember me when you eat bread like this. And he also took a cup of wine that night and he said to them, this wine is special. When you drink wine at your meals together, I want you to remember me and the things that I've taught you. Last week, we shared communion as a church. We shared bread and we shared grape juice and we remembered Jesus and we remembered how much Jesus loves us. All of that came from a special meal that Jesus had with his disciples so long ago. 
it's good to have ways to remember. I wonder, are there special things that your family does to remember things? Maybe, maybe you keep photo albums. I know that one of the things I think about is, and it, it's Christmas season, so it's a while ago, but like when we take out Christmas ornaments, specific ornaments remind us of things that happened. It's important to have ways to remember, to remember people we love, to remember people that love us, to remember good times we've shared with one another. I'm really glad that Jesus gave us a way to celebrate and gather together to remember his love. Would you say a prayer with me tonight, today? Let's, let's put our hands up here by our heart because that helps me remember what I'm doing, that God is close to me. God, we give you thanks for your son, Jesus, for the ways that he loves us, and for the gift of being able to remember him with bread and wine. Amen. I hope that you have a fantastic day. See you soon. Please join me for the prayer of illumination. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. The lesson for today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 19, through chapter 7, verse 12. In these verses, Jesus teaches us eight lessons concerning treasures, the sound eye, serving two masters, worry, judging, profaning the holy, asking, searching, and knocking, and probably his most well-known lesson, the golden rule. Hear now the word of God. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, 
what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. Do not judge so that you may not be judged, for with the judgment you make you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not know, notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye when the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them underfoot and turn and maul you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give them a stone? Or if the child asks for a fish, will give them a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven Give good things to those who ask him. And everything do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law of the prophets. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As a mom, I've spent a lot of years coaching kids who are worried about their interactions with friends. I think that smartphones in the hands of the average 14-year-old makes anxiety about fitting in, having friends, and being with the right group of friends so much more pressing. What if my Instagram post doesn't get likes? Do I look okay in this picture? What did my friends, why did my friends post that picture of me? I can see that my friend has read my text. Why aren't they responding? One of my daughters shared this week that among young adults, it is now the norm to have location tracking on their phone for immediate friends and roommates. They see it as a safety precaution, but it also leads to so much self-doubt. Why are those two friends together at that place? And was I not invited? Why is she with them right now? Sometimes in my own head, and my heart, I want to make this a developmental issue, as in, eventually, we all grow out of it. But do we? Do we really? Our scripture for this week was long, and it feels like a laundry list of really good practical teaching. It is, in many ways, a list of wisdom teachings, sort of like you would find in Ecclesiastes or Proverbs. Don't store up your treasures in heaven, or don't store up your treasures on earth. Your eyes are the lamp of the body. You can't serve God and mammon or God and wealth, as the NRSV translates. Worrying gets you nowhere. Today's trouble is enough for today. Don't throw your pearls before swine, which is a personal favorite of mine. Ask, search, knock. You are beloved. Your Father in heaven sees you. There, 27 verses boiled down into nine lines, sort of. This scripture is so rich, simple, and yet so complicated, and so very hard to live out. 
You've heard me struggle these months with the chapter titles that author Brian McLaren sometimes assigns in We Make the Road by Walking. I have to be truthful and say I happen to love this one. I, I complain about the ones I don't like. I should probably name the times that I think he gets absolutely right. Why we worry, why we judge. The answer, because we don't accept that we're fully loved and fully lovable. If we actually got really good at knowing that we are loved and lovable, made in God's image, we would spend far less time concerned about our stuff, the trappings of material security, and casting sideways glances at, others, at what others do or have or think or say. There's the punchline right there at the beginning, grossly oversimplified, but I stand by it. It's such a good and vital takeaway. You are loved and lovable. You are made in God's image. That is enough. Act as if you know this to be true day in and day out. In our Friday noon study of Amy Jill Levine's book on the Sermon on the Mount, one thing that we're noticing is how Levine approach, approaches the text of the Sermon on the Mount, all three chapters or 110 verses of it, as an interwoven whole that doubles back on itself again and again. It reach, um, she, reaching backwards to what it means to be blessed, and then forward to what it means to worry, and then backward again to how we're called to pray in order to come up with a really great understanding of what's going on here. I don't know about you, but in most of the teachings I got in the church of my youth, the Bible was presented to me in short, predefined chunks that were supposed to mean something all on their own. It was seminary and well into adulthood when I learned to look at a whole book, or even the way a whole book sits within the canon and within lived history. I'm finding that this set of teachings from the Sermon on the Mount is so much richer when I stretch myself to take in how it all builds and interweaves and relies on what was said before it and then foreshadows what comes next. Levine looks at these passages of wisdom that you heard today and draws attention to what comes right before these verses in the text. Instructions on how to pray. Last week we talked a bit about these instructions. Instructions for kinds of disciplines that help us grow our relationship with God so that we are rooted and grounded. And Levine takes her readers back to this instruction about prayer when considering how it is that we will avoid worry and judgment. She points to the instruction about how and what to pray as one way that we center ourselves in God. When we center ourselves in God, when we pray for our daily bread and we remember that we need to forgive as well as to be forgiven, our worldview shifts. When we center ourselves, we are reminded who we are and whose we are. When we center ourselves, we are more apt to act from a place of loving respect for the other. So this teaching from Jesus isn't as simple as, don't worry, God's got this, but it encompasses practices that help us. And practice is the key word, right? We have to practice again and again, building our muscle memory. Because somewhere along the line, most of us have absorbed a bunch of messages about whether or not we're lovable from sources other than God. The media suggests that we don't look like we should. The marketplace tells us that we don't have enough, that our grass is not green enough. Society tells us our skin color is wrong or our native language is foreign. Our mortgage banker tells us that we don't have the right amount of money. Who among us actually wakes up each morning fully confident that we are, just as we are, enough? just as we are, created in God's image. We bear the spark of the creator within each of us. Who among us actually carries that with us 24-7? I think not very many. I am compelled here to say a word about privilege. If you or I, in our skin color, our body type, 
our gender identity, our physical ability, or our sexuality represent the dominant culture, which to be clear in the US is white, fit, cisgender, meaning that your gender expression and appearance match your birth sex, able-bodied and heterosexual, we are more likely to be affirmed in our daily life by the world around us. The more of those boxes we can check, the more the world outside of us tells us that we're okay. And so for those of us who resemble the dominant culture, it is important to remember that even on the days when we feel badly about ourselves, we still carry some privilege and some re reinforcement that others don't. I think it is important for us to remember that it might be even harder for others around us to feel and to know that they are loved and lovable. I ask that we carry that with us not as a source of shame or doubt, but as a challenge for how we hear the struggles of others around us, how we understand what it means to do unto others. The basic truth for all of us is that when we struggle to feel loved, we live from a place of anxiety and judgment, worry and accusation. Here's Jesus in Galilee 2,000 plus years ago, teaching a next generation of leaders that they are loved and that remembering their belovedness is key to not worrying, not toiling, not fretting, and frankly, to treating others with dignity and respect. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is vital and baseline teaching for the future of the church over the next 2,000 years, right here in this teaching on the hill, right? Since the first of this year, I have been working with a coach and a small group of women clergy leaders to develop something called positive intelligence muscles. That basically means that we're working on some psychological models that help us to activate a more positive outlook about everything as we move through the world. It's all rooted in evidence-based practice, material that's standard at places like Stanford Business School. But as we have lived through it, or lived with it, we as clergy women recognize there is another expression of much of the truth that we know from scripture here. We are loved and lovable, created that way by God. This week, one of my practices focused on remembering who I really am. In practice, that means remembering who I am as a child of God. Look at little Laura. Shirzad Shamin, the instructor, shaped meditation this week with these words. You were born with a unique, beautiful essence which is more evident in childhood pictures. Your essence has never changed and will never change. As you look at this picture, notice your beautiful essence, your true self. Notice how worthy this child is, worthy of your unconditional love, meaning this child should not need to perform or achieve in order to be loved all the time without conditions. What if we, as a church, as an expression of God's love in the world, were committed to speaking these words into one another's lives, into the lives of our neighbors, into the lives of the people we encounter each day, you were born with a beautiful essence. God created you and loves you just the way you are. What if it was a message that we didn't wait to, show, to, to share with people when they show up to us, to our services and our classes, but instead we took it upon ourselves to share proactively as we walk through this life as followers of Christ in the grocery store, in PTA meetings, in our workplaces, on the sports field. I think if we practice centering ourselves in God, starting with prayer 
it might come to us more easily. But we have to practice day in and day out, building the muscles that let us love others so well. Levine talks about learning to bring light to every situation we encounter rather than heat. And McLaren says this, Jesus leads us out of an anxiety-driven and judgment-driven system and into a faith-sustained, grace-based system that yields aliveness for us and for the world around us. But it takes practice. We have to try again and again. We have to offer ourselves grace when we fail. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give a stone? Or if the child asks for a fish, will give a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? In everything, do to others as you would have them do to you, for this is the law and the prophets. May it be so. Amen. Mark Miller is a musician, a composer, and a teacher who has grown up in the United Methodist Church. He is also a gay married man has served as a delegate for the Greater New Jersey Annual Conference and teaches sacred music at Yale and Drew Universities. He wrote the song that you're about to hear as a reaction to the way that church trials were ripping apart the lives of dedicated Christian leaders throughout the United Methodist Church. It is haunting. It clings to my skin. I invite you to spend a few moments centering in it now. How will we know for ourselves and for others, that each of us, each of us, is a child of God. And how will it shape our work as the church in the world? So I woke up this morning and wrote this song just thinking about what's going on with our church.
This is one of six special Sundays in the life of the United Methodist Church. Today is UMCOR Sunday, and we receive a special second offering to support the work of UMCOR. You'll see a video shortly, but I want to reiterate how hard we work as a global denomination to create relief supports in disaster situations where 100% of our giving in those moments goes to those disasters. This particular offering supports the operating costs of the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR, so that when there is a need, and they do have to receive and call on special offerings for disaster report, support, every penny of it goes to those locations in need. So today, I invite you, as you are thinking about your own tithes and offerings, to consider what it is you might also offer this Sunday to support UMCOR. And I thank you for your generosity. We praise God from whom all blessings flow. When disaster strikes, we all want to help. But when days are dark, you can't always be there to show the love of Jesus to the suffering. But someone should be there. And someone is. And you are the one who makes it happen. How? By your generous giving to UMCOR Sunday. Your support enables the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR, to act as the hands and feet of Christ, embracing and supporting those in need through their darkest days. Thanks to your gift on this special Sunday of the United Methodist Church, 
UMCOR is able to provide relief and long-term support for recovery. Not only do we provide immediate emergency assistance in the aftermath of a crisis, we also create sustainable solutions in the following months, even years of recovery long after everyone else has gone home. Your gifts form a firm foundation, a base for operations from which UMCOR can reach and serve the hurting. Your giving enables UMCOR to keep the promise that all gifts given to help a specific cause go 100% toward meeting that need. For more than 75 years, UMCOR has met the needs of the suffering. And today, we continue that labor of love and service in 80 countries around the world. Thanks to you and your generous support through UMCOR Sunday, UMCOR will continue to be there this year to show the love of Christ to children, families, and communities when disaster strikes. Because together, we do more.
with each passing day, more and more of the people around us that we love are receiving vaccinations for COVID-19. That news is part of the backdrop of our lives this week, a vision that maybe we are finding safe ways to gather again. Maybe there will be picnics this summer. Maybe there will be places where we can hug those that we love that we have not had the opportunity to hug for so long. I invite you to take a deep breath. And I pray that maybe that breath is full of hope, is, is full of potential. Let us pray together. God, we are grateful for waking up today, for taking breath, for seeing spring emerge, for glimpses of hope. We pray that we could take the moments that we need in each day to let that gratitude flow from us. Let that gratitude buoy us up. Let that gratitude bubble. Thank you. And God, we also carry this week memories of a year ago and memories of what we didn't know then. Memories of uncertainty, misgivings about how life might work for the next few weeks, we thought. We have to mark the time. It's good to notice the resilience. And yet, God, we bear bruises and bumps some of us are scarred and weary. And we know that we can bring all of that to you. God, we pray for those we love who are aching and hurting and needing healing right now. We pray for those who are grappling with tough decisions about money and jobs and schools. We pray for the wisdom to see where you're calling us forward, and we pray for all of the leaders around us who are, we hope, in tune, with ears keenly listening for what it means to be compassionate and merciful and just. And we practice what we've been taught as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, you are enough. And so is every person you will encounter this week. Go out from this place created with all of the gifts needed to bring about the kingdom of God. Go out from this place walking in the footsteps of Jesus, who was the Christ, who is the Christ, who walks before us even now. Go out from this place surrounded by the very breath of the Holy Spirit, who will energize you in moments where you think you cannot take one more step.
Go out from this place to be love and to be light. Go in peace. Amen. Oh, my God.